Hey folks, welcome to the Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. I have another great interview for you on this one. A little bit less structured than many of my other interviews, but I think it's a great chat uh, with some great folks. Rosa and Ellis are partners who work together on their channel, Rosa and the Intolerant Left. Uh, I had a blast talking to them, and it's clear that both of them have a ton of experience on, on the ground working to make the lives of those around them better. Uh, it was an honor to speak with them, and I hope that I can again in the future. Uh, I don't have much of an intro rant this time around, but I do encourage you to check out their YouTube channel, uh, Rosa and the Intolerant Left. I will put links in the show notes as well as a uh, uh, description box for the video and, uh, and support them in any way you can. They are constantly being harassed by the cops and uh, they're doing good work. So uh, try and help them out. Uh, you can contact me on any social media. Uh, leave a comment on YouTube if you don't mind it being public, uh, or you can use my contract form on my website, which is skepticalleftist.com, or you can email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Uh, if you like what I do, then you can support me at uh, patreon.com slash skepticalleftist, and any support at all is appreciated. If you can't support me with money, uh, then hit that like button or go and write a review on Apple Podcasts uh, or on Podchaser. All right. Hi, and welcome to The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist, uh, the podcast where I talk to a variety of people to spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left wing philosophy. And today I'm joined by Rosa and Ellis. Uh, thanks for joining me. Hi. <laughs> no problem. No problem at all. Yeah, thank you. It's very late talking. for you guys. So <laughs> <laughs> It's only like 4 p.m. here, but it's it's getting quite late for you, so I don't want to uh, wreck your night too much, but... Oh, no, we're good. We're good to go. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right on. I can always put more coffee on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I guess the fr a good place to start is like, who are you guys? Well, well um, I've been uh, uh, politically active for about... Uh, I don't want to give away my age. <laughs> <laughs> uh, about 40 years. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, uh, I, was, I was in London at the riots uh, in the 80s. Okay. Yeah? Wow. Uh, against Thatcher. Uh, I took part in the poll tax riot. Yeah. Nice. Um, <laughs> I was also involved with uh, housing action movements, uh, squatting houses. Uh, putting furniture in them, setting up electricity, gas, all that sort of stuff. And no, then uh, no. there was an uh, anarchist bookshop on the old Kent Road in London where uh, we dropped the keys to the house off once we put locks on it. And then oh, okay. if we find homeless people, we go, look, you know, if you go to the bookshop, they'll house you. And they wow. go in there, tell them that, that they're homeless, and they get a, a set of keys to a flat that's got everything <laughs> in it and everything set up already for them, you know? Um, there was one of those in, uh, I did one of those in Bristol as well uh, a few years later yeah uh, I also took part in uh, the St Paul's riots in Bristol um, uh, which was that was about uh, um, uh, police uh, racist police brutality that was about yeah, okay. where, uh, they were regularly coming down to a, prim a primarily black area uh, called St Paul's where I was living and uh, the police were just coming down and um, basically cracking down on everything and everyone you know and right. it, uh, stop and search all that sort of stuff going on every day outside my living room window and it's on the main street of St Paul's that it, that it was all going on and every now and again it would kick off against the police and there was a couple of times in the 80s when it, it got quite big and it was national right. news and all the rest of it, you know. Um, yeah, then uh, then I went on to the illegal rave and free party scene. Um, I did quite a lot on, on that. I'm an electrician by trade. Uh, and I did um, uh, lighting for illegal raves for quite a long time. Nice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it was good. <laughs> it's a good atmosphere and it's a good crew of people, you know what I mean? And it's like, Everybody throws everything in for the benefit of everybody. It's very much anarchistic. Right, vibe, yeah. You know? That's awesome. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, like I say, I've been politically active for a long time. Um, I had a motorbike accident 
uh, about 20 years ago now and uh i'm registered as disabled oh, okay now. um so most of my uh political action now is online um we do do the uh the youtube channel that we have um and uh yeah i mean most of it is radicalizing younger people to action you know yeah which is yeah. pretty vital right now it's <laughs> oh, absolutely absolutely i mean it, another one i think is it, it's important to try and form communities where you live yeah um like for example we live on a, a static caravan site with about 20 caravans on it yeah okay and um there's about i don't know 40 45 people living it yeah You're with openly kids about anarchism and um, yeah i mean nobody minds yeah and everybody it is very much like living on an anarchist commune where I'm an electrician, we have a plumber, we have like, you know, we have builders, we have people that can do all sorts of things, mechanics, all of this. Yeah. And we've got a big shed with a pit in it for vehicle, for doing vehicle repairs and stuff. And everything's done on site and everybody knows each other. Everybody does things as favors for each other. And it's all very awesome. much a barter sort of like you know what i mean I'll, I'll give you an eighth of weed if you can sort out the exhaust on my car sort of thing right you know? right and it, it works you, you it really works right. and when when i moved here there was a problem with um uh heroin addiction on site and people coming on site and uh stealing stuff yeah mm -hmm. and when i came on the site i was very much of the attitude where this site has to become a family we can't be individual units on this site yeah right. and eventually the uh the two guys that were uh uh that were heroin addicts on site that were primarily causing a lot of the trouble uh they were persuaded to move on to a different site down the road and um Oh, there was a there was three guys came on site with a with a baseball bat to to do uh, to rob people. Oh, Jesus! Um, they came and knocked on my door. Um, I beat down on them until they ran away, and then uh, after that, we had the police on site every three days for about three weeks. Oh, geez! And they were just parking in the middle of the site, yeah, in a van. Every time they were there, I was going out there going, what are you doing, mate? Fuck off, get out of here. Yeah? yeah. And eventually, I went out there with my phone. I took took a photo of the, the van with the number plate and then went up to the guy and I said, right, this is private property. What are you doing here? And he says, this is community policing. I said, this is private property. The community that you serve is in town four miles down the road. Right. Fuck mm -hmm. off down there mm -hmm. and serve the community because you're doing nothing here mm -hmm. but causing trouble. And as it's private land, I've, I've spoken to everyone on site. I am the representative of the Residents Association that is telling you right now, fuck off, go away, don't come <laughs> back. Yeah. Yeah. And Just, they, they've gone, they've got, they went away and they've never been back since. That was about good. three, four years ago, you just, know? Just to say, that's certainly not your only uh, interaction with the police, which is, oh, no, you no. know, <laughs> exactly why, yeah. why they, uh, you know, uh, uh, raided yeah, us. Like but basically, I started the YouTube channel before being fully radicalized uh, and, uh, you know, uh, self-described socialist or uh, let alone anarchist. And, um, uh once I when I do things, I really do them, <laughs> and um, <laughs> I uh, uh, so, uh, ran away with a redacted sh throwing anarchist. And um, uh, I, I think that I was already talking in a manner that uh, clearly made made it very clear that I felt I had little to lose and was prepared to make uh, a real um, <laughs> uh, bit of chaos. Uh, and so I think that. Um, uh, working with somebody who knows some interesting things like Ellis does, like uh, uh, 
uh, EMP devices. He can tell you how to build some uh, yeah. and, and uh, take out the comms for a whole set of riot cops or a <laughs> police building. You go to tennis um, you know, open. The idea of somebody <laughs> like me up. working with somebody like him, I think, uh, basically gave him the shits. And uh, so they uh, paid a visit because I just, uh, he was just. I mean, the, the other one is I'm well known to the local police around here for being a bit um, belligerent. <laughs> Uh, uh, I mean, they, they yeah, tried, but, yeah, they have you ever seen somebody call a paras- uh, call a landlord a parasite to their face? Yeah, <laughs> nice. Yeah. It's the sexiest thing in the world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I tell the police to their face that you know they are the guard dogs and lick spittles of the rich, and uh, you know I'm just there for you to persecute. That's that's the only reason I exist in your eyes. You know what I mean? So fucking yeah. go to town, mate. Yeah, and you know what I mean. And I, I tried to tell them how it is. They did a few years ago. They tried to bust me for growing weed. Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah, they got quite a lot of weed out of it. <laughs> and um, it took two years. I, I went not guilty. Yeah. On okay. The grounds. Yeah. Right. Okay. And. Um, like, we don't have much in the way of, of medicinal, like, legal backing for it. Yeah, there, there is like, pretty um, much no legal backing for, mm, like, you know... Like, I, I've got... Um, we we cannabis, both have, have chronic but, pain, but, like, I, I've tried a lot to get access to um, I, to cannabis, and, and it's literally cancer or MS, that's it. Even though the things it helps with, with those conditions are things that could help in other co- people with other right, conditions. Right, right. It's not like th- it's only treating cancer-specific symptoms or something. Um, yeah. It, there's just, they're so strict about it. And did you know that the husband of our ex-Prime Minister, Theresa May, owns, like, the largest medicinal cannabis farm? And essentially the they've largest, got he's the largest a monopoly because of, of the laws in that we maintained. <laughs> He is the largest supplier of cannabis in the world. He supplies to the American market, the Canadian market, the the Dutch market. Like, yeah, he, he Philip, Philip, um, yeah, Philip May. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And he owns. Uh, there's a site in Reading that he owns where it's grown, which is on an industrial estate, and it's a massive site. Wow. And. Uh, I mean, they, they was, apparently he apparently produces around about three hundred tons of premium bud a year from that site. You know, um, yeah, and cannabis is illegal in the UK. You know, so yeah. clearly, yeah, so clearly he's doing something that like he's shipping it out all over the place. And oh yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's a business. It's it's, you know it's, I mean? a, it's a illegal a legal business. But, a legal business um, the thing is because it's, it's because selling to other markets because and, it's uh, illegal in the UK. The government decides who has licenses to grow it, yeah, for export. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, because so Boris Johnson prime, made it obvious the prime to the world, husband, but Britain was already corrupt yeah? as fuck. <laughs> right. <laughs> no one else is going to get a license. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. So yeah, he's got a monopoly on it. But yeah, basically, what happened when I got busted was uh, uh, the arresting officer. Um, I went not guilty. I spoke to a local town solicitor and said look you know i want to go not guilty and he went i'm not doing that and i said okay so you're fired and then i went into the court and said i've just fired my solicitor because he won't represent me in the way that i want him to so i'm asking for an adjournment for me to find legal counsel and they went yeah not a problem yeah so they adjourned it then i uh, contacted the legalized cannabis alliance who put me onto a barrister yeah um yeah then the uh, the officer that arrested me, his two daughters go to the same school and were in the same class as my one of my daughters. Oh, okay. Um, and they are best friends. Oh, jeez. Yeah. <laughs> they are best friends. So Wales is a small place. It is. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so um, when while this was going on, yeah, um, he got a promotion because it was the largest bust in the area for a number of years, yeah, and he got a promotion for it, even though it had not finished going to court. Then um, as soon as the Crown Prosecution told them that there was a good chance I was going to walk away from it, um, he then got put back on beat duty, yeah, because it was going to be a not guilty, it was going to be found as not guilty, so he got put back on beat duty. He started drinking, yeah, Started beating down on his wife. Oh, jeez. 
So she walked out on him, leaving him with his two daughters. They walked out on him and had nowhere to go. So they went to their best friend's house. Your house. My house. <laughs> and went, can we stay here? And I went, well, of course. Of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then it went to court. Yeah. Jeez. At the court, my doctor was being used as a, a witness against me. Yeah. By the prosecution. Okay. And it was pure coincidence. That I bumped into her. I didn't even know she was there. I bumped into her in the court about 10 minutes before we were going in. And I said, what are you doing here? She said, oh, I'm a witness for the prosecution. And I said, really? You know that I'm going to get six years if, if I get, like, uh, I'm, I, they're telling me I'm going to get six years if I'm found guilty for this. And she went, for cultivation and possession of cannabis. I said, yeah. She went, but you've been smoking cannabis for years. You refuse to take opiates. I said, yeah. That's all I wanted you to say in the court if you were going to come along as my witness. And she went, in that case, I'm changing sides. Oh, geez. And she came over as, and she appeared as a defense witness. Yeah. yeah. So it, it was the defense was uh, a defense of uh, of self uh, because of, uh, of management of chronic pain. I no, would... no, 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 no. No, the was idea, it not? No, the idea is, right, right. Oi, oi. The way it was explained to me by the barrister, I was sat in an office with a barrister there's a desk between us with an ashtray on it, a glass ashtray on it, yeah? <laughs> okay. And he said to me, if someone wait, came wait. through the door behind you with an iron bar and wanted to cave in my head, the solicitor's head, and I got up with the ashtray and trashed it across the guy's head and killed him, I would not be guilty of manslaughter, yeah? Because right. I'm saving someone else's life, Right. And the idea is that if I hadn't smoked cannabis, if I didn't smoke cannabis, then I would suffer either serious bad health or death. I, it would be end my life. And what my argument was, was that <coughs> at the time, I was still working as an electrician. Um, I, I built schools, universities, hospitals, all sorts of public buildings. Yeah, that's what I do. Yeah. and. Um, what I said to them was my work and my children are my life. If I, if I take opiates instead of cannabis, you've heard my doctor say that opiates are the only thing that she can give me and that I refuse to take them and smoke cannabis instead. So if I stop smoking cannabis and I start taking opiates, I'm no longer going to be able to work and I'm no longer going to be able to interact with my children in the way that I do currently. Right. Which is an end to my life. Mm. So, yeah, it's life threatening. They took 10 minutes to find me not guilty. Yeah. 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 I've been kicked off of pain management programs because the same thing is once you just explain it to somebody, people like doctors would just lie to get me on them. So, and I would smoke in private, but then like a patient would see it and I'd get kicked out. But, you know, when you actually talk to somebody in authority about these things, because like, um, I said I got into politics late, right? Um, it's kind of a, a weird statement, but it, like in some ways, uh, because um, like since I was a teenager, I've, I've been essentially uh, an advocate for um, for people who've been through shit like myself. <laughs> you know, I, like I was, uh, I used to be a visual artist. I say used to be, which is a sad phrase, but but you know. My my disability is uh, slowly got to the point where like I can't even write that much anymore. My hands are pretty fucked. Uh, I've got something called Ehlers Danlos syndrome, which is like uh, your bones aren't connected together properly by like the ligaments are all constructed a bit wrong, so nothing holds together quite right. You're always in pain. You dislocate, subluxate things, okay. and and I and I have a long history of. Uh, mental health problems so I was pretty much woke up from like a living coma of mental illness and like I say this as somebody with ongoing problems like it, it that was that shit was a whole different level and um but I was always doing activism essentially in my very confined frame of reference of be of a, being a person very consumed by uh experiences of trauma and a lot of these inform uh some of my political views uh, one of my earliest positions was schools sh shouldn't be private <laughs> you know i went right. to a private school and i went i was so aware at the very fucking time that the reputation <laughs> for the school was revenue 
and that the son of a head of department who lived on the school fucking grounds abusing somebody would be embarrassing and a risk to the school fees of other students who might pull out. And so I watched my uh, whole school in, in service of profit enable this for years, ultimately cover it up. You know, I mean, nothing ever fucking came of it. I, it essentially only ended because I left school. Um, and, and it completely, uh, fucked me up. So obviously I went to private school. <clears throat> I grew up with a, a fairly, um, uh, you know, with a middle-class family. I mean, I, um, this now is not the, the first time I've been very, very skinned. Like, you know, uh, as a student who couldn't work, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, I think it's, being student is quite an interesting experience. Oi, you. <laughs> interesting. It, oi. Exper experience for people in terms of their uh, social consciousness because um particularly now it, you know most people are pretty skinny and particularly if you if you can't work um but oh yeah but you know free to know but deprivation wasn't like uh, an alien con concept no. to me um like no. we had it was a very strange school it's sponsored by breweries like as in alcohol oh, okay producers. we had the brick Vic theater and the smirnoff uh, dining room it's very strange um uh, so people whose parents owned pubs got to go for like cheaper and people oh, who were in the army so and so you know i i you know associate with working class people in as much as i associate with anyone really at school and um uh but and i i you know i, I remember right from I've always been a, a bit of a loner. So when I, you know, do go out or when I used to go out, it was always on my own. And, and, uh, anytime I see a homeless person, I'd ask if they want some company because <clears throat> it's fucking lonely. I mean, like I've, I've had a few close, um, homeless friends, uh, when I've lived in London where I've, you know, put them up on, you know, cold nights and, and shit. And, and, you know, I've heard how fucking alienating, and lonely and dismissive. I mean, I, I sat with a man after I saw just the most awful thing of him asking somebody very politely if they had any change, and the man doesn't even <coughs> acknowledge him at all, not a flicker in his eye, puts his hand up in front of the man's face and just walks past him. It's and, like he doesn't exist. Yeah, and it was so... my I was so angry, and uh, you know, we sat for a while. But anyway, I'm thinking about like one of the first times I did that. And I had friends at Windsor Boys and Girls School. Well, no, not really, really at Windsor Girls School, but, you know, Windsor Boys School, which is a weird place because you've got Windsor Boys School, State School, and then just, like, 10 miles, you've got fucking Eton, <laughs> you know, which is where all of our prime ministers come from. Oh, jeez. Uh, through, through that fucking yeah. school. they got, like, a plaque on the wall of all the past students, alumni, or whatever you call it, who have become prime minister. And these kids, these overindulged kids grow up and see that like this is what you can be in this environment it's so gross um, i believe um our last cabinet uh I, I believe that nine of 12 of them went to eaton private school okay and six of them were in the same year wow <laughs> yeah so yeah so i've sat multiple times with unhoused people opposite a motherfucking castle windsor castle and just marvel mm. at the insanity of it, just the the dichotomy of it, like the absolutely, and and <sighs> and discussed, you know, and and every time I, you know, see, I, I could I, conclude nothing else other than it would be just to seize it for them. I grew, I grew <laughs> you know? And I used to talk to people about this, like, and I genuinely think, come the revolution, you will find that unhoused people are more than fucking ready. They've been ready for a long time, like, you know, it's. It's about critical mass, and there are people like you know Ellis who have have been uh, held the revolution in the hearts for a fucking long time. And it, it, when we succeed, it won't be because of the people who newly felt the feeling and pushed us over the edge. It will be because of every single person who uh, ultimately made up that critical mass to put, right. push things. Yeah, everybody has a part to play in the revolution, whichever side they're on. The only thing I have to do is choose the side, you know. Um, I mean, even if all it's like me now, yeah. I don't go out to protest. I don't. I don't go and throw fucking firebombs at cops anymore. Do you know what I mean? I right. sit. I sit on fucking Facebook and try to radicalize boomers mm. and and the youth, you know. And I, I'll. It, 
it's, it's yeah, like, that's all I can do. That's yeah. all I can do. But as long as I can radicalize people and I see people being radicalized, right? You know, that's what matters. That's what matters. That is the contribution that I make at the moment. You know, mm. that's fine. Yeah, everybody has a role to play. Mm. You know, it even if all it is is throwing down fucking dank memes. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's it's incredibly. Uh, I I am continually frustrated by the limitations of the things uh, that that I, that I can do. Like I, I did used to really like going and uh, speaking at, at protests, um, which I didn't do that often. And I, something I found the most frustrating is like, even though I was so clearly pushing myself very hard to be there, like I would be just kind of staggering on my crutches, even though I was clearly pushing hard to be there, which obviously means I would like to be there more, but I just can't, you know, nobody um, on the street or doing any of the parts of uh, direct action that I can't engage in want to hear from, from me mm. any strategic advice just because I'm not physically there enough. And right. it's such a weird thing of yeah. like proximity giving legitimacy, just like physical closeness. And and I kind of, it's it's frustrating. I, I think that there is something in that that's just subconscious um, and, and happens. Uh, I mean, uh, I know that, you know, I work differently when I'm on my own versus with somebody and versus talking to somebody from a distance. But um, I think, you know, disabled people have, particularly since uh you know uh i mean <laughs> social democracy was like a small tiny little peak and then neoliberalism is it, disabled people have more reason that, than many to hate the capitalist system more time yeah. than most to dedicate to informing themselves raising their consciousness yeah. and um engaging in the thinking that must come with any action you know um i mean the other one is the other one is i'm i'm one of the three founder members of uh Aberystwyth antifa yeah and it's not just i mean I, I sort of like you know i say oh you know my role is throwing down memes yeah or whatever uh there are real consequences to your actions online Right. Yeah. This is a book and that constantly like, oscillates between, like, I'm a revolutionary a, and I'm a shit poster. So you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's there's, uh, there's there's a rock down the road on the coast. Yeah. Uh, about eight miles away. Yeah. And um, years ago, in the 1960s, uh, the English government decided that they were going to flood a valley in Wales, which had a village in it called Drewery. Right. And there's a rock on the coast that's painted red with white writing on it that says uh Drewerin, which means remember Drewerin. Yeah? Because it was part of the Welsh people had no choice. The people in that mm. village forcibly moved out and that valley was flooded by the English government. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And the the Welsh people had no say in it whatsoever. And it's counted as a, a it's it's famous. It is world famous. Yeah, yeah in in terms of um, like a displacement of population for profit, it's yeah. it's like gentrification on steroids mixed yeah. with extraction. It's it's awful. Yeah. <laughs> right. Eh? But at the end of the day, that rock is quite important to the Welsh people, the local Welsh people. Yeah, because it means something to them. Um, the Welsh language was made illegal for two hundred years. Right by the English, mm. yeah? The oppression of the English against the Welsh has it's gone on for over 600 years, yeah? And that it's a strong, deep feeling within the Welsh people, right? And someone decided to paint a black swastika and a black sun on the, on rock. the rock itself, yeah? Oh. About two years ago. And I took it upon myself to try and fucking find out who it was. Mm. And I found out who it was. I found the three guys that were involved. And the guy that actually did it, it was his idea. He was the one that, with the paintbrush in his hand, he was the one that painted it on. I contacted his boss and said, look, mate, sent him a photo on, like, uh, emailed him. 
sent him an attachment with a photo of the rock. And I said, this is what one of your employees has done. This guy with his name. Yeah. I said, there's evidence to prove that he's done this. This is a massive slight to the Welsh people. And I don't think that you should be employing him. Mm. And he got the sack. Right. Yeah. And I had... No, I get for, what you're saying. That there, there can be uh, real-world material uh, <coughs> absolutely. from... I mean, so anybody who understands if, even uh, dialectic materialism should bombs. understand that things like online activity can have material results in, yeah. in the real world. Yep. Yeah. And the, the, there's a Just relationship between the two. because you can't get the out the door doesn't mean you can't actually create yep. and do something. Yeah. You know what for I mean? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I had a lot of comeback from local fascists with that, though. Uh, my personal Facebook profile, uh, for about a year, any time I posted anything, it would get reported. Oh. Doesn't matter what it is. Yeah. And I, at one point, I had uh, a three-day ban, a one-day ban, a seven-day ban, and a month ban, all running at the same time. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it was a pain in the ass because Facebook's the only way that I contact my, my children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then you can't uh, message. And, yeah. yeah, being banned from Facebook can be a bit of a bitch, you know. But, yeah, yeah, that, that's eased off an awful lot now. I, I haven't been banned for quite a long time. But I have been sort of trying to tame what I put on there a bit, <laughs> you know. <laughs> It's, it's just uh, to no direct know. threats of violence to them. <laughs> yeah, they, they don't like that. <laughs> I mean, the police may have come here under a false pretext, but they did legitimately find some illegal things and just like noted it in their brains and, and left. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, if, if they want to, they, they can. There's a guy at the moment, he was meant to be uh, released from prison like two weeks ago. His name's Toby Schoen, and uh, he was working with 325 No State, uh, which is a, a you know a online collective that, that publicizes uh, information about riots whenever they happen around the world. Um, okay. And uh, they um, they seized uh, the servers in something called Operation A Dream. He was the only person present. It was an international effort now interestingly the state logic of operation a dream is that anarchism is an inherently terroristic political ideology of course of course we believe that <laughs> naturally because yeah. that's a reasonable you yeah, know yeah. Uh, kind yeah. of framework and uh, you know no justification provided i i've read i've read the outline it's, it's and absurd. they call what they've got a democracy right yeah. You know yeah. I mean? yeah. Yeah. exactly and so um they tried to bring a, a terror-based case against him they failed. Um, and so instead, they literally banged him up for four fucking years for personal possession of some niche psychedelics that help him with his cancer. Mm. And, um, you know, I mean, nobody, you know, gets locked up for four years for personal possession of anything for just no reason, you know, and, and it's clear that they just, they know that they shut the bed. They tried to put him in prison. They tried to attach a special surveillance order with all sorts of seriously rep politically repressive measures it would have required him essentially to inform on all of his comrades which he oh. lives collectively with it would have made collective living impossible for him uh, without um compromising the security of everybody around him yeah. and um you know, they that had to be uh, challenged in court and so uh their his defense defeated that um but they've just extended his stay in prison to december and parole, which is, can add conditions like apparently without any sort of legal challenge until the day you find out. And by the time it happens, he may well have broken those fucking conditions and be back in prison. Um, <clears throat> uh, they, they're they attaching um, uh, advi advice uh, from the counter-terror agencies on his parole, even though he's not in for terrorist offences. Now, yes. he's in for personal possession of drugs. So essentially, right. you know. So how does that have anything to do with terrorism? Yeah. Has a bit yeah, of yeah. mercy, yeah. and you know, you go to prison, but you will won't renounce your anarchism. You'll never see the light of day again, son. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's that's basically the scenario that they're painting if this president well, stands. I, I don't even know officer, if it is a president. His, I mean, his wing officer told him that he was going to kill him and blame it on another prisoner. Oh, jeez. Yeah. He was yeah. being, uh, I mean, this is a man who I think is a self-confessed fascist. Certainly, I think yeah. you can make it a fair, fair assessment of as a fascist. That's the SO of the prison, the, the wing office, his 
Wayne yeah. Robinson, he's the Wayne threatened to make false intelligence reports to compromise his release and did it. And done so, um, yeah. Wow. Abuses the Muslim prisoners um, uh, and, and Toby for his Irish descent mocking events like Bloody Sunday, which is obviously incredibly cruel and an unresolved uh, injustice in our country, uh, yeah. where there's still a lot of Yeah, we haven't been making uh, videos for a while and we've been trying to kind of uh, figure out what we're going to come back and talk about. And the plan is to talk about sort of the wave of direct action in the UK, but not just there, you know, around the world, uh, because, you know, uh, <clears throat> one, of, one of my uh, earliest realizations about one of the points uh, on which, you know, there can be no unity. You know, I, I, I'm interested in discussions of left unity, sure. like, but no unity can be blind because that's madness. <laughs> that's, yep. that's literally yep. baseless. Uh, so um, one of the things, uh, you know, I, I noticed in Extinction Rebellion, particularly uh, one of their spokespeople, <clears throat> Rupert Reed, was there's uh, a contingent of the environmentalist <laughs> movement um, that is interested in living on this island like a lifeboat and kind of okay with other people dying. In fact, right. there are some of them who think that that is good and will redress balance to nature. Ah. Um, th there's uh, some real uh, issues there. You know, I mean, the, the people who are the most vulnerable, you know, if we're going to assign blame are <laughs> the least responsible in many instances. And the fact that they don't have the resilience to deal uh, with the increased risk is again due to our actions in the Imperial Corps. And um, so, you know, what's happened in Pakistan, you know, uh, for us, it, it's, it's about saving everyone. You know, it's more about preventing genocide than avoiding extinction, because if we don't stop this, if, <laughs> if we survive on a lifeboat, see the blood of blameless people i don't think we deserve much other than extinction yeah, yeah. and you know the <laughs> i've said before that the first island to go underwater leaving as its only trace the floating corpses of its inhabitants which is literally what we're on course to do there are no fucking plans for relocation of these people upon this event no fucking plans happening and all these environmentalists who say we're not going to stop 2%. Okay, so where the hell are you asking for these plans in, a, in this eventuality? Because that will result. I mean, the reason actually 2.2% 2, 2 is was changed for this reason, because um, it became 1.5 precisely because island nations were like, uh, guys, we'll be underwater beyond yeah. then. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, we like literally a, an international body agreed to something initially that would have killed these people and they had to bring it up and like address it. And, and you still got people saying, well, we're not going to stop that. And it's like, so what are you saying is going to happen to these people? Because I just, I don't feel anything about nationhood <laughs> personally. I never yeah. have. I, I just don't, I really don't. Um, I think it's very weird. The conversations of, of like, mostly just English people talking about being upset about Wales becoming independent or, or Scotland. It's just like, but I would be more comfortable in my relationship to another person if there was some uh, fairness in that, in the relationship of the power structures that govern our lives. You know, it is a fundamentally undemocratic system. Wales literally has no constitutional mode of exit. Uh, you know, I mean, Scotland's is highly debated, but at least there is some uh, legal right. uh, literature that, that underpins it. Wales got nothing. <laughs> Wales had nothing on entry. And, you know, obviously agreements between kings and fucking rulers <laughs> are not exactly, um, it can't really be claimed to be consent of the people, can they? Um, so so it's, it's turned into an entirely colonial relationship, even though the empire itself was a precondition for British colonialism. You know, to be able to um, control your entire island landmass was uh, extremely advantageous in in empire. And and here's the thing about empire <laughs> geography, people, is the only reason that the countries that are safer from climate collapse that have uh, reaped the benefit of 
empire um, and then globalization is just geography. Sheer chance of where we land on the map. Europe is is a strip across one um, you know band of of the hemisphere. There's not big climactic changes. You can move your armies, move your crops far easier than a, a force in Africa could go from a, above the equator, over the top, and down to the bottom of the Horn of Africa. You know, it's it's just a different prospect. It's not because um, you know Europeans were more in, ingenious. It was just advantageous um, location. And the other thing is human movement is the only goddamn reason Ooh. any of us are in any of the nations we're in today. Mm -hmm. And those nations are artificial. Human movement is entirely natural. It's in fact the only reason we're here in these nations to have these concepts of nationhood. So it seems just absurd to me to um, hold as sacrosanct something that is illogical, unnatural, and harmful <laughs> over something that is inevitable. And and it's like, when I characterize this as a genocide, it's, um, like I've just written, a, it, not for the first time, a poem citing a definition of genocide and explaining why something that people don't think of as genocide is in fact genocide. I've done this before, but, <laughs> but in both cases are very sound. Um, because, you know, uh, to deliberately inflict upon the group conditions of life calculated to bring about physical destruction in whole or, uh, or part. And <clears throat> the thing is, is does it matter? Deliberate. The calculations were made mm -hmm. a long time ago. And with them, tons and tons of promises. Like, I mean, promises that we still talk about today about resilience funds and, and uh, you know, uh, what essentially uh, amounts to today's discussions of climate reparations, promises were made in anticipation for their need, and they have never been fulfilled. Um, billions and billions, what would amount now to trillions. And, and, like, and what matters is that they knew what was coming and they didn't change course. What matters is they can see it is right fucking here, and they are doing nothing to change course. That is a choice. That is a deliberate choice. And the consequences are known. So if you are somebody who believes that inaction is not morally neutral that you know that as we all think we agree you know that all the evil needs is for good men to do nothing well then you are responsible for doing nothing and letting evil things or evil people do bad things mm -hmm. you know and uh, you know so <clears throat> when i see the victims of the melia massacre in spain you know, after uh, Spain takes in like 100,000 Ukrainian refugees, and I'm glad that they were given security. That is not, you know, obviously the point I'm making here. The point I'm making is that they shot down about 40 people and killed them in suppressing the passage of just 200 Africans from the Morocco border. Right. They, and, and I mean, I don't know how many people died eventually because there was just a pile of injured people. Um, and all I feel is that this is war and I'm on their fucking side. And if that island goes underwater and this country still is just fine with that, then I don't know if I can constrain my rage to just power. You know, I, I don't know because, and, and until that point, I am, I am fine, uh, you know, with, with the patience to understand, you know, people's lack of, ability to do much about this but i i find it to be the most uh the most convincing argument for action to be taken uh as soon as we propose yeah it, it, what we're saying is that we have to fight at a pace that actually is commensurate with the scale of the challenge faced and if you are concerned in for the threats faced by the most vulnerable people that means fucking now. That means yesterday. That means as soon as we get the chance, any opening. Yeah. That's what it means. And so that's the thing that I think um, could be what um, radicalizes some other people in, into a readiness for action sooner. It, it's that confrontation. I mean, there, it was a pretty, you know, standard documentary about, uh, you know, the alt-right. I think it was called Age of Rage, the alt-right. Um, okay. by the BBC but it was just it was the only one that pulled together very well the um, the issue of migration um, 
climate induced uh, migration and the response the question that was going to be asked which is sanctuary or genocide <laughs> and the fact that some people have already got that answer mm -hmm. in them they know what our answer is and so i became convinced of the necessity of confronting as has always been my approach with the kind of advocacy I did around, you know, my own experiences was confronting people with brutal fucking realities and, and trying to get people to face the issue sooner rather than later. You know, I, I don't want people to make this choice only when things get really scary and self-preservation is an even stronger motive. Um, so it felt like a conversation I have now, but, you know, everything I see tells me that the, the answers I already have for that conversation need to be acted on now and um and then the hope is to bring other people with you because i i just can't live with it i can't live with it um you know just uh the, I, i've done a lot of reading about uh climate induced migration and uh one book i would recommend like as two, okay two <laughs> two books i'd recommend to people like above all others is uh empire of borders and also uh, Tropics of Chaos, Christian Parenti, and uh, the Empire of Orders is Todd Miller or something. And um, it also talks about the role of, uh, of violence in uh, the world and how uh, you know, conflict over scarcity. Somebody was talking about water wars earlier. People are already fighting, you know, where wells are drying up mm -hmm. and groups or, uh, or tribes are being pushed closer together by having to share a well that they previously didn't need to you've got groups coming into contact and, and conflict with scarcity, uh, which is a false <laughs> scarcity, of course. Um, you know, we have the capacity to feed everybody. It's just not fucking profitable to. And, 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 and that's the, um, the thing is, is that when you understand what the stakes are and you understand that you're not making that genocidal choice within uh, an accurate um, uh range of of conditions but rather you're constantly being told that tons of things aren't possible mm -hmm. if those things are possible then what we're doing is fucking reprehensible and i truly believe those things are possible and so i can't forgive the inaction yeah yeah, yeah. uh that's yeah. it makes me think of uh in canada we talk about like in order to stay like and I don't really buy in the whole nation of Canada thing. Like it's kind of trash to me anyway, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, people have d like done this work to figure out, like we need to stay economically viable. Canada needs a, a population of a hundred million by the year 2100, but we don't have enough in like incoming immigrants to do that. Yeah, and, yeah. and so part of me thinks that like, uh, the neoliberal state is thinking like, okay, well, once climate change makes certain places uninhabitable, those people will have to come here <laughs> and we will be yeah. more like, I mean, it's it maybe a little bit of a conspiracy theory. But <laughs> yeah. I, I, think, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think if you read Empire of Borders, what you'll see is, is uh, a, a long, um, uh, long worked on uh, construction of a, a system in in anticipation for um, climate change uh, and its influence on migration, and this proliferation of borders, um, you know, funded by uh, the U.S. so that the U.S. border was the last line of defense, not the first. Right. The idea being that you make every other border as hard as fuck, and nobody can get to you because they're too busy back there, and uh, and they've let all sorts of human rights abuses occur there, of course, course. Um, trained them in horrible ways, of course. And uh, it it certainly seems like, um, and I think that this is possibly, uh, you know, I mean, the reason people reject the idea of, of dealing with uh, an aging population by taking immigrants is racism. Maybe the reason why they are more concerned with constructing these barriers to these people is racism within the, uh, the those in power and capital, you know, I, I mean... It, it is hard to understand how they wouldn't see that as something to exploit. But at the same time, um, you know, <laughs> it, they don't do things that are reasonable. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, and it's, uh, I think it's, it's also um, having somebody else suffering horrifically can 
make somebody else in tolerate some pretty awful shit because they think, well, I'm not, at least I'm, I'm not, not that, that. I'm, yeah, at I'm, least I'm, I don't have that. you know, right. Really. When, when really, you know, the U S empire, uh, you know, fucks, uh, its own people, just like it fucks other people around the world, just in different ways. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and having a, a pitiful masses can make you feel protected, um, and convince you you're not being constantly assaulted and, uh, extracted. Yeah. From. Yeah. It, it, creating an, un, like a specific underclass that has like all these really poor, uh, state of being, right? Like then you, you know, you, you got your workers, they're placated. Well, now, I, now I can, you know, I can make my minimum wage job and, and yeah. barely make rent with three roommates, but I'm not at the border being abused by <laughs> border mm-hmm. guards. Yeah. So I think, yeah. I think perhaps the uh, part of the uh, thing about why they're not so concerned about um, being able to have a large enough workforce is that they will want to automate. And, 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 you know, I mean, somebody once asked me, do you think automation is the greatest threat uh, to workers or greatest liberation? I said, literally, that's a really dumb question. It, it could be one or the other. It really just depends who it's hands it in. <laughs> um, you know, but it could literally be the most incredible opening up of our lives and personal development and development as, as communities, or it could be the worst dystopia we've ever known. <laughs> um, and it is all about whether that is uh, <laughs> replacing your work or replacing your job uh, and your livelihood. Um, and, uh, and I think that, that they they will likely wait until uh, they can automate uh, automate a lot at once. They don't want a long running movement against automation, as uh, you know, because there is already one, right? People are already unsatisfied with you know self checkouts and and things like this, and right. Um, uh, but it, it will get worse. Um, and and I I think that there's it's like degrowth is is the same thing. Degrowth could be, um. The only way degrowth is not just austerity is if it's redistributive. Right. <laughs> like, like it could again. There's different degrowth. Some better, some dystopia. And like, it, it's. I find it really concerning when people just band around degrowth as a, uh, an answer because yeah. it, it's like people aren't fucking stupid. They may understand the arguments that uh, that continuous growth is unsustainable. But they also know, even though they know trickle down is bullshit, really, that the only way that their economic prospects improve is if the state of the economy improves. And um, so, and that means growth. And therefore, when you're telling somebody degrowth, but you're not telling them how their life is still going to get better, you are dismissing something so fundamental um, yeah. as a concern that it is it's really appalling politics and appalling uh, um, you know, engagement with people on the precise level at which we're meant to be helping them, which is their material conditions and their hope for the future. And to dismiss that, you, you lose any ground that you were standing on as as a voice for them to think that they should listen to. Um, so I think not only is it uh, just a open-ended advocacy, that could go, you know, in completely the wrong fucking direction. Um, it's also, uh, you know, a mistake. Like, I mean, the question, quiet quitting. Is that a thing going on in the US? <laughs> uh, this is pissing me off. <laughs> so I hear it is, but. I, right. When, I, when, I was, <laughs> when, when I was younger, it was called work to rule. Oh, yeah. 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 You're just um, not doing extra shit. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 Work to rule makes more sense to me than quiet quitting. Yeah. Quiet quitting what literally that implies that, that you're not doing you your job I mean? anymore, and people are like, "Oh, they're calling us lazy." Well, you're you're literally handing it to them. You're saying, "I'm not doing my job anymore." The point of work to rule is I'm only doing the job you're paying me to do, and you're not even yeah. paying me enough for that. So you know, that, that's <laughs> it's, it's like there's so, there's so many it's so uh, uh, mistakes I see in 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 advocacy that uh, yeah. like of of ostensibly good shit that I, I just want to shake people. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, the quiet quitting thing really ma- baffles me because I've always been like, okay, when I'm at work, I'm at work, and when I'm at home, I'm not at work. So don't fucking call me. Yeah. Don't, yeah. <laughs> <you know>? yeah. <laughs> yeah. don't bug me. I'm not. I'm yeah. not at work. 
<laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think I think is that there's also, I mean, not only is it rhetorically, you know, giving it to your opponents to to call it quiet quitting, it's also disconnects it from a history um, that is yeah. comprehensive that took a lot of discovery of legal limits as to the what you can define as what is within the remit of the job you're paid for. There's like, uh, you know, um, uh, capitalists came up with this con concept of what was it? malicious compliance yes yeah that's right <laughs> it's literally a term they came up for for work to rule action malicious compliance you're complying with what your job is and and that is malicious of you yeah, <laughs> you know i mean right. it's, it's so dumb but the point is that there is a history to this there's legal um precedents that people need to be aware of if they're engaging in this action now by calling it quiet quitting divorcing it from work to rule as uh, a, a form of direct action that you know has lessons to be learned from its implementation in the past it's just uh it it's again strategically unwise uh, just <laughs> wildly <laughs> um, but i mean ultimately we'd love to see uh work-ins but we have had a, a realization about that may not work as well nowadays because of the electronic transfer of wages um but but that that would be good well i mean i, I think i think the thing is is uh you have to, with working, you have to understand that uh, everybody has a part to play within the business. I've, I've had my own business, yeah? Everybody within that business has a part to play, mm -hmm. even the accountant, yeah? It was the most legitimately so, socialist example of, of, of running a business <laughs> I've ever heard of. He paid himself the least, and all of the decisions were made um, by all the trades right, together. I, and I'm, a, uh, I'm a qualified high-voltage electri uh, electrical fitter, yeah? anything over a 1,000 volts. Okay. Yeah, so that's industrial, uh, hospitals, shopping centers, yeah, stuff like that, right? Um, it's all... Uh, it's all most of it is commercial, yeah. Yeah, um, I employed uh, up to eight people at a time, yeah, okay. uh, to work on different contracts. Um, there'd be like a school somewhere that's a hundred miles away, and there'd be a factory 50 miles away, two contracts running at the same time, two teams of four in like four in each one yeah my job as owner director all the rest of it of the business my job is to go and get contracts find contracts yeah to make sure that the money's paid for the contracts that we've done and to make sure that that's distributed amongst the workers in the business yeah yep and the only the only money that doesn't go to the workers is money that goes to things like van upkeep, tools, you know what I mean? Equipment. Equipment, yeah. supplies, yeah, all of that, yeah. So that's how I worked it. And because all I did was ride a motorbike around all day, like going <laughs> to meetings and signing checks and signing contracts, I'm doing fuck all. The guys that are working <laughs> are doing the fucking work. Right. Yeah. So... If you're unqualified and you've got, you know, you've got no qualifications and you're just a laborer for one of my guys, I'm going to pay you a hundred pound a day. Yeah. That's 500 pound a week. That'll cover your rent. That'll cover your food. That'll cover expenses. Right. Yeah. And you'll have a bit left over. Yeah. You won't need to claim benefits to be able to do any of that which every other employer, it doesn't matter where you work, you get a job, you have to claim benefits to top up your wages so that you can pay the rent. Mm, yeah? yeah, that's it's just the way huge, it fucking works. But I don't want that for my workers, right? Right. So the minimum I paid was £500 a week. If you're qualified, you're getting £750 a week. Right. Yeah. I mean, you have to bear in mind this was 10 years ago now. Right, so that's yeah? pretty decent then. <laughs> yeah, it was a good wage. Yeah, it was a good wage. Yeah. And um, myself, I paid myself as much as I paid the untrained guys. Okay. £500 a week. Yeah. And the only thing more that I took than that was petrol for the bike because I did do a thousand miles a week on the bike. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, this, so yeah, it can't come out of your living yeah. expenses. <laughs> yeah. 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 
I mean, you know, the, if, if I paid myself 500 a week and tried to do a thousand miles a week on the bike, I would not have much money. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. 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 So, and it worked. And when, when I went for contracts, um, it got to the point uh, after a couple of years where we, we'd be offered contracts rather than having to go and look for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like, you know, Tesco would come up to us and go, yeah, we, you know, we've got a contract for you. We're doing an expansion on a 24 hour Tesco's. Can you come and work nights, 12 hour shifts? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, fucking no problem. You know what I mean? Good money in that. Yeah. Yeah. And we'd usually try. I, the only thing I ask of the people that I'm paying to, that are working for me is that they work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't want to see you standing about watching fucking neighbors on your phone. (laughs) Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Considering he's not nicking your surplus labor value, I think it's a fair request. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the idea is that if you work, most, most crews on building sites don't work Mm. most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. They're looking for ways out of work. Right. Yeah. So, can't blame if them. you if <laughs> if we've got a contract right and it's a three month contract and they're paying us enough money for, for me to pay all of my dudes for three months and all of the supplies and all of the ancillaries and fucking everything right and it's a fat check for that yeah that's i mean you're talking tens of thousands of pounds on a check right right sometimes hundreds of thousands yeah and when what I used to say to them is, look, you know, this this check is not for me. It's for us. Yeah. So the sooner we finish this job, yeah. the more money we're getting paid for the amount of time we're working because it's a standard fee for doing the job. Yeah. So if it's a £40,000 check at the end of the job, yeah, and we can do it in three weeks, <laughs> that's a lot of fucking mm-hmm. money coming our way. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yep. And that's how we used to do it. And we made quite a lot of money at it, you know? It was it was good work. Funny True. how people are more motivated when you're not, <laughs> like, exploiting them. Well, the other one was, like, <laughs> yeah. you, get, you get a bonus at the end of every job, right? Because there's always money left over from the check. Right. Yeah? Because you you finished early. Yep. Right? So you're not paying six weeks' worth of wages. Yeah? So that just gets divided immediately, equally between everyone. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. There's, there's no like, oh, yeah, I'm having that as profit. Fuck off. It's like you actual incentive to... Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they deserve it. So I'd split it equally between everyone. I mean, another one we used to do is because it was like high voltage, a lot of the cables are like this fat. Right. Yeah. So the copper core on them is worth a fortune. And there's always excess cable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I used to have a hydraulic cable cutter for cutting fat cables. Yeah. And you just whack it in the cutter and cut it, cut it into meter lengths. And then you pay one of the unqualified guys, one of the laborers. Yeah. You, you tell him to spend the whole day just stripping all of the casing off of the cable. Right. So that it's all down to the copper cores. Yeah. And you end up with a big rack of these huge, fat copper cores, yeah, like big bars of copper. And you chuck them in the back of the van, take them to a scrapyard, you get 1,500 quid for them, and then just split the money between everyone. Yeah. You know? It was a fucking banging job. Really good job. I really <laughs> yeah. enjoyed doing that. No you know? kidding, yeah. That sounds yeah, awesome. it was fucking brilliant. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's not often that you, uh, you hear examples of people who call themselves socialists or, or anything like that running businesses that are, are in any way uh that committed to uh to to the ethic right you know? uh, so yeah no i i thought that was, that was pretty impressive yeah All right, folks, that's everything. Thanks for watching and or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends and on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it, and it helps me spend more time on this and my other projects. If you want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. 
If you can't contribute financially, then a five-star rating or a, and a review on the podcast app of your choice or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then check out the show notes for links to all my stuff or check my website, skepticalleftist.com. There you can check out my other show, From Many People's Strength, which is a podcast about Saskatchewan politics. Uh, you can check out the videos that I do with my friend Damien Maria at Hope and all my old content from the Brainstorm podcast. You can also find the links to my Discord, Reddit, and Twitch. Uh, you can contact me through my website or by emailing mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. My Twitter is at Skeptical Lefty, and my Facebook page is The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. Thanks so much for watching or listening, and try to get involved with something in your area, and let's all work to make the world a better place. <laughs> <laughs>